All right, here we go. We have San Francisco street legend Booby, founder of Big Block. Welcome to Vlad TV. Oh, man. Pleasure, man. It's an honor, man. Pleasure to be here, man. Oh, yeah. Someone who grew up in the Bay, uh, Big Block was a name you always heard. Yeah. Uh, you know, so it's interesting we're finally getting to sit down and talk. That's what's up. So this is our first time talking together. So let's go ahead and start at the beginning. So you grew up in Hunter's Point. Yep. Uh, and what was Hunter's Point like in the 70s and 80s? Well, in the, in the 70s or 80s, it was just, it, it, it was cool, man. It was fun. You know, it was a lot of unity, a lot of love. You know what I'm saying? I grew up there ever since 71. I was born in that house I was in. So it was just, it was just, uh, you know, it was a lot of family origin, you know, a lot of love and, it's just, you know, it was just a fun place to be. You know what I'm saying? We all just, you know, grew up together. My uncles and aunties, my, my mother, my grandmother, everybody stayed up there on 19 Arbor Road. So it was, it was it was good, man. It was good. You know, I mean, and growing up in the Bay, Hunter's Point was always this kind of infamous area. Yeah. You know, like people say Hunter's Point and, you know, there'd, always, there'd be fear associated with that neighborhood. <laughs> you know, and I was, I was across the water in the Bay. I grew up in San Mateo and then later on in yeah. Oakland and Berkeley. But Hunter's Point in San Francisco was always one of these really infamous areas that everyone always talked about. Yeah, yeah. I and mean, why, why do you think Hunter's Point had that reputation back then? Because if you weren't from there, you shouldn't go there. <laughs> you know, and it's like, you know, you know, I have seen a lot happen. Like, you know, as growing up as a kid, you see a lot of stuff, you know what I'm saying? Like, it was notorious, but if you was from there, you had a lot of love, you know what I'm saying? So just just growing up in it, you have a lot of love. But I've seen a lot of things, and you know, been around a lot of things, and you know, it, 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 it was it was notorious in its own way. But if you didn't know nobody, you had no business being around there. Okay, and the Hunters Point area, it was housing projects. Yes, projects. It was, it was all hood projects. Okay, and are they spread out, or is it kind of more? Built? It's a hill. It's it's a whole hill. You know what I'm saying, like. Up there where we at on Harbor Road, Northridge, Kiska and all that, that whole stuff used to be all projects back when I was growing up. Then they tore most of it down, but the but the house I grew up in is still right there. The, the part of the project is still right there. So a lot of it remains the same. And then you have projects all over the place. You know what I'm saying? Like it, it, it was just, it used to be a big old hill with nothing but projects. It used to be old army barracks. It used, it used to be old army barracks and they turned them into low income housing. Got it, got it. And it's right there over by Candlestick Park, which used to be the uh No, it ain't by Candlestick Park. Candlestick Park, that's Deborah Rock. Is Deborah Rock is right there next to Candlestick. You gotta come up that hill and okay. you gotta come all the way up in there, and that's where we at up that hill. Okay. I mean it's the same general area, but it's Yeah, same general area though. Yeah, same general area. Got it. And you know, when you hear of San Francisco, you hear of Hunters Point and you hear of Sunnydale projects. Mm-hmm. And I mean, was there like a beef between these two neighborhoods? I mean, back in the days, back in the gap, you know what I'm saying? It, it, it was it, it was a beef, and I really don't know what was the kind of cause of it, but Hunters Point was all together at one point in time, and then, you know, somehow they got into it, you know, with Sunnydale, and and it was just a real serious situation. It was a real serious... I was kind of young, but I was still old enough to, you know, to, to be a casualty. But my mother stayed over there. My mother stayed at 12 Brookdale, so... You know, I always had a report and I kind of went to elementary school in Sunnydale, too. So, you know what I'm saying? But, yeah, it was crazy. It was crazy. You know what I'm saying? It, it, it was real, too. You know, people died. It was real. You know what I'm saying? Well, in the the early to mid 80s, that's when crack started to hit the Bay Area. Mm -hmm. Do you remember when that happened and the neighborhood started to change? Oh, yeah. Crack. I remember when 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 crack was around back in like 84, 83. And um, at first it was just like, almost like a secret. But then it just it just turned into a, 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 like an epidemic, like a pandemic. You know how like, we just experienced a pandemic and just, it just went crazy. That's how crack hit. When crack hit, it was just, it was just easy. It was fast money and, it, and everybody wanted it. It was, it, was, it was a real epidemic, you know what I mean? Okay, so you yourself, at what point did you start getting mixed up in the streets? Um, I say I probably uh about fourteen, fifteen when I caught my first case, selling weed. You know, I was I was young. You know what I'm saying? Went to juvenile. So that had to okay. be like that had to be like eighty five, eighty six. Okay, 
But with weed, that's really more mellow. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. You know, the the gu- the uh, the guns and the and the violence and the murders really don't come with weed all that often. It's really nah. really more of an easygoing type yeah, it's, of it's, yeah, it's a different lane. It's a different right. lane, I will say. So at what point did, did crack and cocaine uh, become part of your life? Probably about, I would say about 88, 89, you know, where it really got real serious, you know what I mean? Okay, and you're like 17, 18 at the point? Yeah. Okay, and how did that start with you? Well, you know, it, it was it was just like we seen it. We was around it. You know, as youngsters, you know, we used to sell weed. And then, you know, just being around and, and, and seeing people sell weed, you know, you just like, and then you, you see this little white substance, you're like, damn, what's that? And you get curious, you know what I'm saying? And then, you know, once you start dabbling into that, the money change. You know what I'm saying? And, and so from that point on, it, it, it was, it, that's what it was. It was over with. I mean, with the addiction, you know, like me and Freeway Ricky had long conversations about this. And he was like, you know, one of the biggest drug dealers on the, on the West Coast. Mm-hmm. Where in the beginning, when crack hit, people weren't really becoming addicts yet. People were still functional. It was functional. You know, crack crack addicts, basically, where they would they would get high after work or on the weekends, but they still have their job or, mm-hmm. you know, they still had their family. But as the years progressed, you know, people yeah. started becoming homeless and, you know, basically just living in the street yeah, trying that, to get high all the time. Yeah, it, it definitely catch up with you. I done seen it firsthand. It definitely catch up with you. You know what I mean? Like, o- o- over the time, I mean, you know, you'll catch a person with a good job you able to come spend forty, fifty dollars a day. Then that's turned into thirty dollars a day. Then twenty dollars a day. You know what I'm saying? Then ten dollars a day. You know what I'm saying? So it, it takes a toll on you, and it's a very, you know, you know, just like any other drug you abuse. You know what I mean? Yeah. Did you yourself ever try it yourself? I ain't never tried no drugs. None. Never tried it. Never attempted to try it. Never snort cocaine. Never nothing. Heroin. None of that. Only thing I ever weed? smoked was weed. Okay. A, a bunch of it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And that's because you were seeing the people around you. Just yeah. To yeah. I just never. I just never wanted to indulge. You know, people of my peers, they thought it was it, it, it was fancy to snort cocaine. You know, I always looked at it like, man, you know, that could lead to something. I'm cool. I'm scared of drugs. You know what I'm saying? Because I'm scared of it. Because I. I smoked so much weed, I said, damn, uh, imagine if I was to try this weed, I, uh, uh, I'm cool. So I've always been scared of dr- any kind of drug, you know? Yeah, I mean, me too. I remember uh, one of my best friends overdosed and died off cocaine at 23. Yeah, and see? I went, to that, I went to that funeral and said, nah, I'm, I'm never going to try this. Like th- th- that, that situation right there made me never want to try cocaine, even though people had offered it to me over the years. Yeah, I done seen cocaine snorters, snorters start using crack and then from crack to, you know what I'm saying? I seen them graduate. So I, I was never a fan of it. You know what I'm saying? I seen them graduate from heroin, from snorting heroin to shooting it. You know, it's just it's the generations. You know, you see them, you sit back and watch, you'll watch them graduate. You know what I'm saying? So I just never was a fan of the hard drug. Okay. So you started dabbling, you know, in terms of, of crack selling around 18, 17, 18 years old. Did that start to build up pretty quickly? No, overnight. Overnight. Okay. And were you getting arrested right away or not so much? Nah, I got arrested one time, probably in like 92. And um, I went to jail for it. You know, I, I got arrested, went to jail. And I told myself I'll never be out here selling crack again. You know what I mean? Because I'd have to be out there. You know what I'm saying? So, you know. Yeah, and, and okay. that was really like the only time I ever really a- actually got caught out there with crack. Okay, how much time did you get for that? Um, they gave me uh, three years probation. It was my first case. They gave me, I had got a good lawyer. They gave me three years probation and, and some time served for the f- couple of days I was in there. Okay, and was that around the time the big block got formed? No, nah, I, I formed it a couple of years after that. Okay. Probably, so probably, like about, in, probably like in 94, 94. Okay. So tell me about Big Block. Well, Big Block is a uh, it's a record label. You know what I'm saying? It was a label 
you know that where we uh you know produce artists, manage them, you know, and, and produce records. You know what I mean? And uh, you know, back in the back in the days before I even used to sell weed, I used to try to rap. You know, I used to, I used to, I used to try to be an MC back when Shadi and all them was out, but it wasn't no money involved. You know, we didn't have no sponsors, wasn't no money. And so we used to do talent shows and I always had a passion for it. So by me having a passion for the music, but way back then when I was 14, 15 years old, I, I just was like, uh, you know, I just always had that passion. So when I was able, you know, I started my own label. Okay, and that was Big Block. Yeah. Well, at what point did, did you meet um, the Matthews brothers. Uh, uh, I grew up with ev- them. Eventually, you know, and they eventually formed RBL Posse. Yeah, I grew up with them. We grew up. We grew up from kindergarten. We grew up. We grew up together. Mamas hung tight together. We grew up together wearing matching clothes, and you know, we grew up from kids. They stayed in the same building as I stayed in. Okay, so RBL Posse formed, and mm-hmm. they put out their first album. And in yeah. fact, you're actually on the cover. Of that first album, yeah, uh, a lesson, a lesson to be learned. Yeah, correct. Even though you're not actually a rapper or even showed up on the album vocally, never wasn't wasn't a part of none of the production or none of that. Just you know, just on the cover. Okay, and did you guys have any business at that point together, music wise, or not really? Nah, we didn't have no business music wise. Okay, so it was just some homie shit. Like I was gonna have our homies yeah, on the you, cover. You, you, yeah, just just some just some homies, family. Like you know, some stuff like that. It wasn't it wasn't nothing. It wasn't nothing contractually, you know, binding. You know what they was doing. You know what I'm saying? That was just something they did, and uh, you know we we was all supporting it. You know, we was all supporting it. You know what I'm saying? And so that's just what it was. Okay, and by that time, Black Sea who's, you know, one of the, the core members of the group, he had lost his eye to, a, I guess, a gunfight? No, nah, you know, just, it, it was during the time when Hunters Point and Sunnydale was beefing, you know what I'm saying? So it was one of the times where, you know, people come through shooting, you don't know who's shooting, you know what I'm saying? You know, they come through the block, they shooting up the block, people shooting back, you know, he, he, he got, you know, nipped in the eye. Okay, so... The first album comes out in 1992, A Lesson to Be Learned. Mm-hmm. And uh, Don't Give Me No Bam or Weed, that was the hit song yeah. from that album. And that was kind of a Bay Area anthem. I remember when that came out. Exactly. Um, and as an independent album, it actually did pretty well. It was number 60 on the R&B and hip hop charts. Yeah. It, it started to buzz. Definitely. Um, but then I guess after that, there was some friction that started between you guys? Yeah, I mean... I wouldn't, I mean, I wouldn't call it friction. I just call it more than hate. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> you know, because anybody that know me know I ain't really, you know what I'm saying? But yeah, you know, it is what it is. Was what it was, you know? Well, I guess there's a San, Fr- San Francisco Chronicle article in 2001 where you said uh, they got some money and said they didn't want us around. They showed a lot of disrespect to me and my family. Oh, no, I ain't never said nothing like that. Oh, that wasn't you? No, that wasn't me. Okay, hold on a second. Let me just look this up to make sure I don't, it's not a misquote. Uh, Well, I mean, that quote is is attested to you. The way Stepney told that RBL Posse dissed him by cutting him out of the money and bailing on the hood when the royalty checks started rolling in. No, I I never say no shit like that. All right, well then, San Francisco Weekly misquoted you then. Yeah, San Francisco Weekly, man, yeah. They they never interviewed Uh, me. I never interviewed with San Francisco Weekly. Was there any disses or anything else like that that was happening during that time? Did they ever... I mean... I mean that you know you gotta listen to their song, man. One thing about me, I, I don't talk about men, man. Only, only female talk about men. You feel me? Just you know, you gotta go back listen to their songs, and you know it's evident to what it was. But you know, like I ain't had nothing ever bad to say about them dudes, man. I wish them the well, you know. Well, according according to the story, the the issues between you and RBL Posse kind of split the neighborhood in two. No, I split the neighborhood in one. Get it right. In one? Okay. Because I mean the way the way the way it's laid out in the papers was that, you know, a bunch of people associated, you know, who were cool with you, big block, chose one side, and then the RBL guys were on the west side, uh, west side mob side. And yeah. then that created a friction 
in, in Hunter's Point. That ain't even Harbor Road, though, that side they was on. That ain't okay. where we grew up at. <laughs> okay. So, I mean, is that accurate or not really? I mean, it, 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 it partial. It, 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 it's it's, it's kind of accurate, you know what I'm saying? Because, uh, you know, I guess, you know, the dudes go around with it, anybody that, that had a bad taste for us, you know what I'm saying? So if you, if, if you were somewhere in the city and you didn't like us or, you know what I'm saying, I guess, you know, that's where you can find them. Well, did you know David Hill? Yeah, I know him. All right, so David Hill, who was associated with Westside Mob, he was accused of murdering a police officer, uh, Isaac Espinoza, in 2004. Yeah. Was he convicted of that or no? Yeah, I think he was convicted of it. Okay. So, so now you have this general area in San Francisco and these two crews are not getting along and things started to get crazy. Uh, a lot of shootings. Yeah. Uh, I mean, during that time, how many people were getting killed? I mean, I can't really say the number. Only can just account for my loved ones. You know what I'm saying? We had a, we had one of our youngsters get killed. You know, he was he was a baby though. He was like 15 years old. You know, rest in peace to Jarv. You know what I mean? R.I.P. Jarv. And um, uh, you know. You know, that was about it, as far as that go. And, and everything else, I don't, I don't, I ain't really added up the numbers on it. Okay. I mean, was there ever a point during this time that you and whoever the guys were on that side tried to get together to sort of calm this whole situation down? Yes, it was. I, uh, I had um, put together, uh, like, you know, like we, we, we tried to make it right. And so, all of us and, and a couple of dudes from um, from West Point, West Mob, you know, we got together and um, had a meeting at the mosque. We had a meeting at the mosque, and I, you know, brought everybody together, and, and you know, try to hash it all out. You know, try to try, you know, try try to make it right. You know what I'm saying? Because a lot of them dudes I fuck with, a lot of them dudes I grew up and went to school with, a lot of them I fuck with, and some of them I was fucking with to the time of my um my incarceration. You know what I'm saying? So. I had a report with a lot of them dudes, but it was just a, a few of them weren't trying to hear it. So I tried to bring them together. And um, shortly after that, they came and arrested me. Oh. Mm-hmm. What did they arrest you for? Just for that, all that, all for everything. Hmm. You know, it was just for everything. You know what I'm saying? Just, you know, and I was just trying to, you know, bring, you know what I'm saying? So, you know, you know, that's how they work. Okay, well, I just want to go down the timeline here. So, you know, the first album came out, mm -hmm. did well. Then in 1994, the second album, Ruthless by Law, came out. Mm -hmm. and that actually hit the Billboard 200 charts. It was mm -hmm. like 197 on the charts as an independent album. Impressive. Yeah. And then RBL gets signed by Atlantic Records. Yeah. And before the third album comes out, Mr. C of RBL Posse gets murdered. Yeah. I mean, according to reports, he got shot nine times and killed near his home uh, on New Year's Day. And that set off a whole bunch of retaliation murders. I don't, uh, I, don't, I, mean, I, don't, I don't think nobody died after that, but yeah, Mr. C, he was a good dude, man. You know what I'm saying? Those was my bros, man. You know, I, I had a lot of like love for bro. You feel me? Even though he wasn't raised up or grew up around us or, or from around there, he was a genuine dude. He was a good dude. Just got put in a, uh, you know, he got put in a bad situation. Okay. Did the guy that killed him or the guys that killed him ever get arrested or do you not know the story? No, I think it was unsolved. Unsolved, okay. Well, then in 1997, the Eye for an Eye album comes out and that actually hits 70 on the Billboard charts, mm -hmm. the Billboard 200. So once again, you know, the group is starting to grow. Yeah. Um, and then in 1998, and I was looking this up, you uh, you get charged with terrorist threats uh, for something that happened near, uh, near a recording studio? Yeah, I got, I, got, I got charged with terrorist threats on a cop, man. Oh, on a cop? <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay, so what happened with that? 
Well, basically, you know, I was just sitting on the block and uh, the dude was rolling through and he kept like, you know, he kept rubbing neck and looking all at me and, and acting like he wanted to harass me. So uh, he go up the street, go down, come back up a couple of times and he finally get the courage to jump out. So when he jumped out the car, you know, I just took off running through the projects. He chased me. He chased me through the projects. So when I take off running through the projects, he chased me. I get behind the building and I tell him, you run up on me, I'm going to knock you out. You know, and, 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 I, and I, you know, I took a stance on him. But what he did was he told him I pulled a gun on him. I ain't had no gun. He would have killed me if I would have pulled a gun out on him. I just told him I'd knock him out. Like, you run up on me, I'm going to knock you out. So he let me kept running. I ain't fast at running. I couldn't get away from this dude. This dude a slim dude. He let me get away just so he could put them charges on me. You know what I mean? Then they raided my house and did this all kind of crazy stuff. Put a um, million dollar bond on me, shoot the kill. So it was just all just, just bullshit. So I got charged okay. with terrorist threats. Okay. Did you end up beating that charge or no? Yeah, I spent like 8000 on a lawyer and I had to tell the police sorry. So I had to bail out for a half a million and then I had to uh, get the lawyer and the lawyer went in there and I just had to go to court and, and say sorry to him. Okay. Well, uh, by 2000, things were getting worse. Yeah. Uh, there was a, a situation where four people got killed in one week. Oh, well, yeah? Yeah. Um, you know, police said... Uh, felt there was a retaliation for a shooting uh, that was aimed at West Mob that left two people dead. Apparently, uh, two other guys got, got killed and it's just, it was just a bloodbath in, in Hunter's Point. Yeah. Um, do you remember that time? Oh, uh, I remember, I remember, I remember everything like yesterday, but I don't remember no, you know, I don't know. I guess you just, when you, when, you, when you out there, you know what I'm saying? I, I guess you, you know what I mean? I, I don't know exactly which murders they t be talking about. You know what I mean? Uh, let's see here. Let's see if I can look it up. Uh, Starvell Junius, 17, was killed after he sat in a car with a friend uh, who was also shot. Uh, I don't know if these names... Uh, when Starvell uh, withdraw? Yeah, that's the one I was telling you about, but he didn't die in 2001. I mean, he probably did, probably like... 2000, yeah. 99. It's a 2000, May, Two. May 6, 2000. Okay, yeah, that was Jarv I was telling you about, the 15-year-old. Right. Jarv and, and Starvell was in the car together. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay, now, were you getting shot at around this time? Oh, uh, yeah, I done been shot a few times. Okay, you actually got hit. Yeah, I got hit with an AK before. Can you talk about that? Well, yeah. Yeah, I was sitting up there. Uh, I was just chilling in front of my baby mama house, just, you know, underestimating everything, you know, just was out there chilling. And uh, I was hanging out for too long in front of her house, you know what I'm saying? I knew th this ain't my neighborhood. This ain't really nowhere where I should be at for this long amount of time. It's anybody's neighborhood, so... I was just sitting up there chilling, talking to a few of the guys. Let's you know, a blazer rolled down the hill. The blazer rolled down the hill. AK hanging out the window. The first shot hit me. I just kneeled down by the car. You know, they kept shooting. I just kneeled down. You know what I'm saying? They kept shooting, 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 shooting. And um, I bounced up and jogged to the house. But I didn't even know I was hit because the bullet went straight through my arm. And my baby mama like, you bleeding? I'm like, yeah, I looked at my arm, it was bleeding. So I just walked up to my car, jumped in my car and drove myself to the hospital. And they patched me up, you know what I'm saying? The next morning I was back out. I mean, usually when there's a shooting though, there's a police investigation. Yeah, we don't do no talking. Okay, so you didn't see nothing? I ain't yeah, seen nothing. nothing, I don't know who did it, you know? Okay, I mean, was that the first time you were shot? Oh. Uh, yeah, far as far as relation to that stuff, other times I've been shot just in the wrong area, wrong time. Got shot in the foot okay. back in like 92, you know. 
Well, I mean, you're getting shot and it's all happening in the same area. Was there ever a point where you just said, listen, I'm just going to move to a different, you know, part of the state or to a different part of the country and just leave all this behind me? Yeah, I mean, yeah, you know, I, I, I was I was to a point, you know, what I'm saying where I felt like, you know, I was trying to, you know, do things right. But but at the same time, you know, things happen, you know. And, um, you know, if we knew better, we'd do better, you know? Well, I mean, if you talk about you got shot in front of your baby mother's house, that means that whoever shot you knows where your children live. Yeah, so, they just, they, 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 yeah, they knew, they knew I was up and around. I think somebody called them, though. I'm a firm believer that, the, like, it was some dudes standing around or somebody rolled by and called them. Cause I don't be up there. They just, you know, what I'm saying that's where she stayed at. But I don't. But I think I'm quite sure somebody called her. Right. So not only are you, you know, at that point concerned for your own life, but then you had what one child that was living there? Yeah, my daughter. Your daughter. So I mean, imagine if your daughter got hit in the middle of that shootout. No, it'd have been crazy. Yeah. We I probably mean, wouldn't even have this interview today. <laughs> right. <laughs> You didn't think to move to move your daughter somewhere else or, or oh, something yeah. like that. Yeah, I, I actually had her had a move before that, but you know, when, when me and my baby mama had a misunderstanding, she wanted to leave. You know what I'm saying? I had them; they they they, they was safe the whole time. But you know, sometimes be a misunderstanding in the house. She like, well, I'm gonna go live in my own house, and woo, woo, you know, and I can't stop her from doing that. Well, uh, by 2001. Uh, the police were really heavily investigating what you guys were doing. And they started tapping everyone's phones. Yes. Were you aware that your phones were being tapped? Uh, I wasn't really aware, but when I got aware, it was pretty much too late. But I never really talked reckless anyway. You know what I'm saying? Like, I didn't, I wasn't on the phone talking about nothing or doing nothing like that. I guess their strategy was to get people that was talking on the phone crazy and, and get them to flip. And it, and it pretty much worked. But as far as the wiretaps, they didn't have me doing nothing. Well, they may not have had you doing anything, but I read through some of these wiretaps yeah. and whoever was around you was talking crazy on the phone. Yeah, that, that motherfucker told in 10 months. <laughs> My, like I'm looking at some of these quotes, some of these phone conversations. Yeah, One dude said, uh, I just had a Flat two guys, dog. <laughs> uh, I'm heated. I'm about to go get my gloves and my nine. Yeah. Uh, you know, an another one, they were talking about how they jumped out of a car and said trick or treat before shooting <laughs> on their victims. Yeah, that's crazy. Uh, I, I mean, these are actual phone conversations that people are having over cell phones. They were actually phone conversations. Do you know the guys I'm talking about? Who, who exactly, I'm quoting right I know now? exactly who you're talking about. <laughs> okay. Cooperating defendants. That's what they call them. <laughs> uh, okay. When you found out about these recorded phone calls and you first read through the transcripts and saw this, what'd you think? I was like, it's over with. Hmm. You know what I'm saying? I already knew what I had to do, and I pretty much knew what they wanted to do. You know what I'm saying? Cause, cause when you dead bang like that, it's only, it's only, it's only, it's only, it's only, it's only two things you're gonna do, man. You're gonna take the deal, or you're gonna tell. You know what I mean? A ain't no, ain't no in between. Ain't a such thing of being halfway pregnant. Either you is or you ain't. Either you're a real well, guess, one or you're not. Uh, say the last part again. I say either you're a real one or you're not. August thirty first. 2001, 200 FBI agents and San, San Francisco cops and flak jackets and assault rifles went through Bayview's, Bayview Hunters Point and started arresting everybody. Yeah. You remember that day? I remember it clear as day. What were you doing that day when, when the cops bust in your door? Shit, I was in the bed. I was in the bed, butt naked, chilling. You know what I'm saying? They, I told him they didn't have to blow my door off the hinge. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It could have just knocked on the door. You know what I'm saying? Well, they come in there with smoke bombs and, and blew my door off the hinge and then, you know, went to the federal building, everybody up in there. So, you know, you kind of met everybody at the building. 
Like, wow, bro, they got you. Oh, they got you too. Or, you know what I'm saying? It was just crazy. It was crazy. How many people got arrested that day? I think about 15. Okay. So 15 guys get arrested. These are all guys that you knew. Yeah. Did you guys get to talk to each other when you were, when you were locked up? Well, off top, they arrested us and they separated me from a lot of them dudes. You know what I'm saying? And, uh, and, and put us in different sections and had us in different places. You know what I'm saying? So we, we got a chance to talk when we go to court or we was in the pod or whatever in, in, in the thing. But, you know what I'm saying? But not really chop it up, not really talk. You know what I'm saying? They, they made sure they kept us separated so they could see what everybody was on. You know, and they listening to people in jail. So they still investigating you while you in, in jail. OK, because. Someone close to the prosecution said, uh, that's the way you do it. You need wiretaps, witness protection, all the tools in the federal toolbox. Mm -hmm. uh, so witness protection, were people actually testifying and-, and Oh you yeah, know, they, they was leaving. They was going, they, they was taking, they, they, they was gone. Yeah, they was, they was rolling out the building, you know what I mean? Left and right, they was leaving. Okay, and there was a lot of indictments, but, uh, you know, Assistant U.S. Attorney George Bevan, he put you at the top. Yeah. He made you essentially the leader of, of this whole operation. Exactly. Fraudulent. Okay. Um, you, were, you were charged with conspiring to run a major crack distribution ring using violence, intimidation, and armed <laughs> assaults against other tr drug traffickers and rival gangs to protect your profits. Crazy. You got hit with 27 felonies. In addition to being charged with distributing sizable amounts of crack, uh, it also said that you orchestrated a shooting on West Point Road, which several big block members out of a, hopped out of a green van and began uh, shooting at West mobbers with heavy uh, combat weapons, a fully automatic AK-47 and an AR-15. Yeah. And they found those guns nearby. Yeah, bullshit. Just for the record, man, I want to make this clear to all the viewers, man. I ain't never told nobody to go do anything for me or for any other reason. I never. I never said, oh, man, go do this or y'all should go do this. I never suggested it, and I never told anybody to go do anything. It's not my kind. Okay. But, but they're pinning you on. They're pinning this yeah, on. Yeah, yeah, that's what they do. Right. So I guess what they're saying... What they said was that you engineered a, a March 2001 assassination attempt on A.C. Matthews, who was part of RBL Posse, right? Yeah. Uh, A.C., what, 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 was his, what was his rap name? Uh, I, don't, I don't think he had no rap name. Oh, okay. Okay. So, based on an FBI affidavit, they said that uh, two big block trigger men fired numerous rounds into the vehicle. Uh, A.C. Matthews wasn't in the car. But his girlfriend was driving with a five-year-old girl riding the passenger seat. She was seriously injured, uh, but the child ended up, you know, unscathed. And with all these charges, including this, you were facing multiple life sentences in prison. <laughs> For sure. And you're how old at the time? 20, 28. Okay, how does a 28-year-old you know, get his head around doing double, triple life? Well, you know, I come in there with the, with the thing was, you know, I was willing to take 30 years off the rip, you know, just based on, you know, I, I know how it is, you know, just give me 30, you know what I'm saying? And so as I started fighting the case more and more and more and learning more and more about federal law, you know, I realized what they can do and what they can't do. And, and you know, and I just fought. So I end up, filing a motion to get a search warrant expunged. And we actually won that motion. If you look up, you know, my, all my information is public records. So when we won that search motion, we, the government got caught lying. So when they got caught lying in them affidavits and, and, and lying and doing what they do, you know what I'm saying? That's what allows me to get a 23 year sentence. Okay, leading up to that sentence, do they offer you to cooperate against all the other guys and walk away. They always do. If, if you ever went to the feds and they say, 
and the dude say they never asked you to tell, he lying. You know what I'm saying? They, yeah, they, 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 they ask whoever to tell. That's that's what they do. It's a okay, win-win many, for them. How many of the guys that were indicted with you actually cooperated? I'd probably say out of 36, probably about eight. I want to give a wow. shout out to all the women too that stayed solid. You know what I'm saying? We had a bunch of females on our cases and none of them told. Okay, so eight guys cooperated against you. Uh, how close were you to these eight? Um, well, really, only was close to two of them. Okay. That I really was close with and grew up with. When you found out that those two were cooperating against you, how'd you feel? I just felt like, you know, you get to thinking back on the signals, the signs that was there. Like, you know, that motherfucker, he acted like that. You know what I'm saying? Like, you get to thinking back on people's actions and patterns and stuff like that, and you be like, yeah, okay. But I just looked at it like, you know what I'm saying? He made his bed. He got to lay in it. You know, that's him. He got to look himself in the mirror every morning. You know what I mean? He, you know, he made that bed for himself, you know? Well, right. When you talk about the feds, they have, what, a 98% conviction rate? Oh, yeah, for sure. I'll probably say 99. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? Right. So everyone who's part of this, they know that they're all going to prison if they don't cooperate. Exactly. So it's either cooperate or it's, you know, you're not going to beat it in trial. Yeah, cooperate or go to jail. Do your time. Right. Okay. So by the time you copped out, you were 33? Yeah, I fought my case for like five years. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Did you have a bond during that time or were you sitting in jail? No, I sat in jail the whole five years while I was fighting my case. Okay, because they didn't give you a bond. Nope. I put up one point three. Risk, I put I up. I put up one point three million for a bond, and they said they wouldn't let me out because of the cooperating defendants, and you know I'm a danger to their case, to the community. And um, uh, you know, they just denied my bond, so I never got right. out once I got arrested. Okay. So you ended up copying to two charges. Three. Uh, three charges? Yeah. Okay, well, you 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 copped out to conspiring to distribute over five kilos of cocaine. Mm-hmm. Conspiring to carry a firearm. Mm-hmm. And then as part of the deal, you actually admitted to participating in the 2001 attack, the shooting attack when, the, you know, Matthew's girlfriend got shot. No, it, it, it was a conspiracy charge. You know okay. what I'm saying? I never admitted to shoot nobody. It was just like conspiracy is just like if these dudes go and say they did something and they say I had knowledge of it, now I'm charged with conspiracy because I had knowledge of what happened. Not not that I was an actual shooter. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Right. I mean, because according to the paperwork, it said that you admitted to obtaining and paying for assault rifles that was used in that attack. Yeah, probably. But, uh, you know, they got they got their way of getting getting what they want. You know what I mean? Okay. Now there's another member uh, in the indictment, Kim Ellis. Yeah, my bros. Uh, he didn't cooperate, and uh, not at all. He ended up getting a, a twenty a twenty year sentence uh, yeah. for cocaine. Uh, how many people went to prison in that group? Uh, see, it was a couple of us went to prison. Me and Kim did the longest, though. But, uh, it, 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 you know, a lot of people went to prison. Yeah, you know, little bros, he did like 12 years and on down. You know what I'm saying? But me and Kim, we, 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 we the one got stuck up. We was the last two co-defendants. Okay, now you accept a 23-year plea yeah, deal? 23-year plea deal, yeah, sentence. I mean... You don't hear people accepting plea deals that long. Usually when you're facing 20 years, you say, fuck it, I'm going to go to trial and see what I could do. Yeah. But in your case, what, you were just facing multiple life sentences? Yeah, and I knew the deck was stacked against me. You know what I'm saying? I, I knew they had stacked the wall up so high I couldn't climb it, you know? So, it, 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 you know, that's, that's what it was. You know what I'm saying? And, uh, you know, I love me some me, so, I'm, you know, I'm you know, I'm going to die a real one. You feel me? So I, I, just, I just took the time and went, and went changing for nothing in the world. You know? Right, because all those arrests were part of a five year FBI investigation. Yeah, exactly. They spent five 
years and and hundreds of agents <laughs> with wiretaps, uh, you know, suspects, the whole nine. I mean, leading up to those five years, were you aware that the feds were watching you guys or not really? I mean, I mean, I was aware of it sometimes, but, you know, like, like I'm from the projects, you know what I'm saying? So, it's, it, you know, in the way I was moving, that's what took them so long, you know what I'm saying? Because they had to cheat. They had to come up in there and cheat and, and do all kind of, you know, unorthodox stuff to even get us in the building. You know what I'm saying? Because... A lot of them charges weren't even federal charges. You know what I'm saying? They just, they just, you know, threw a, a glob of stuff together. But that's what they do. You know what I'm saying? So, you know, and and, and and it's just like sometimes you see them and sometimes you don't. You know what I'm saying? But even when they got us in 2001, they really didn't have us. They just only had a couple of people that they had on a wiretap. But their whole strategy was to get them in there and flip them to make them tell. Like, you know, just like how you see in the movies, you know what I'm saying? They get the rest. They go rest everybody. They rest people that you don't know. They rest people that ain't got nothing to do with you. So they interest in, in, in you is, is, is zero because I, I don't I don't deal with you. I don't I don't I don't I don't fuck with you. So when they go get at you to cooperate on me, you, you're going to do it because I don't I don't really fuck with you. I don't fuck with you. And a lot of the dudes yeah. I never fucked with. You feel what I'm saying? So it was easy for them to turn. You know, well, in 2003, a uh, hitman from RBL Posse uh, got shot, shot in the head while driving through Hunter's Point. Yeah. Did you know Hitman? Yeah, I knew Hitman. I used to babysit Hitman. Really? Yeah. He stayed in Sunnydale. And um, remember I told you I used to stay in Sunnydale with my mother back in the days. I used to go babysit his mother. And my mother used to be cool. And I go over there and babysit him and his brothers. I mean... It's just kind of telling in terms of how bad it was because you're talking about a group, you know, with RBL Posse, two of the members died violently in, in what, their 20s? Yeah, it was unfortunate, man. It's crazy. I mean, were you and RBL cool by the end of that time or was it still kind of funk? By the end of what time? Well, by the time, you know, before you got arrested and everything else like that. Cause you're talking about 2003, you got arrested in what, 2004? I got arrested in 2001. Oh, 2001, okay, so so he got killed while you were basically awaiting trial. Yeah. Fighting your case. Got it. Um, yeah, man, it's just it's just sad hearing the, this whole situation yeah, unfold a, like this. It's a sad story, man. And for the record, man, I wrote a movie about it. So sure. stay tuned, man. You know, yeah. So, so, what year did you did you take your plea? I played out probably like in two thousand five. Okay. So two thousand five, you played, and then you got transferred to a federal facility. Yeah, two thousand six. How was that situation? Once I mean, because you know you're just in county the whole time. Yeah, up to and, that. Uh, I was in Max and Santa Rita. I was in um. North County, between North County and Santa Rita. Okay, and then you get put where? Um, Victorville, okay. fe federal prison, Victorville, down in LA. So what was it like to start to start your federal federal time? Well, it, it was all a learning experience. When I got there, it was different from being in the county. You know, after being in them counties for so many years, then you get to a federal prison where you're out all day. And this, and this, and this, you know, it's almost like, you know what I'm saying? It, it was an experience and, it's, and it was a learning experience. It was a learning okay. experience for sure. You know what I'm saying? I learned a lot. Well, you were locked up for 19 years. Mm hmm During those 19 years, what do you think were some of the worst things that you experienced? Some of the worst things? I mean, I lost my mother while I was gone. I lost my grandmother while I was gone, you know, and I think that's the top two worst experience I done had as far as being in jail. It wasn't no, it wasn't no really, you know what I'm saying? It wasn't no bad experiences. So you served 19 years. Correct. You get out in January 2020. So let me just do the math here. Uh, you are 
47 years old when you get out. Almost half your life was spent in a cage. Yep. You know, you you missed everything pretty much from two, you know, the 2000s were basically just something you didn't get to experience exactly. in the world. Uh, the internet, cell phones. All that. You know, iPhones, uh, you know, electric cars, uh, just all this stuff that we take for granted, you know, social media, whatever else, suddenly gets introduced to you as you as you get out. Now, you got 23 years, but you get out after 19. Is it like an 85% thing in the feds? No, nah, yeah, you do 85%. But I had got uh, 14 months off, you know, um, Trump passed something that gave me 14 months off. Other than that, I'll still be in jail. Okay. What was that first day out like? Oh, man, it was amazing. But, you know, I had to do... I had to do uh, nine months in a halfway house, so it still felt like I was locked up. You know what I'm saying? So, and I, I just couldn't believe it was true. You know, when you walk out them gates, you'd be like, damn, man, it's really true. But then you go to another facility, it's like, uh, okay, okay. But now that I'm all the way out, I've been out for like 120 days now, it feel good. Okay, what was it like to finally leave the halfway house and finally just be completely free? I felt a little free. A little free. Yeah, I felt a little free. Uh, are you still on probation? Yeah. For how long? Ten years. Ten years probation. Yeah. So you're not really free then. That's what I'm saying. At any point, your probation officer could show up at your house and just rummage through your whole house. At any point. Um, if you get pulled over, they don't need probable cause to search your car. I mean, they Cause, do because they, they have to call like a, a federal parole agent out. They can't just search my car like I'm not on state parole you know what I'm saying okay but but I, my car can I, I will allow them to search it because I'm not doing nothing anyway but technically right. well, they have to I, call, yeah. call out somebody with authority right but what I'm saying is that you're not you don't have all the rights of a regular U.S. citizen no yeah and and if you do anything to violate this they'll send you right back they'll send you back okay uh, but you're out which I'm is, out. <laughs> which is the bigger deal. <laughs> I made it, man. <laughs> you know, do you ever go back to Hunter's Point? I mean, nah. Not really. I, I don't really got no interest. I mean, you know, it's, it's a lot of stuff going on out there and people, you know, they need help. You know what I'm saying? So, but if I can't help them, I ain't trying to, you know, you know what I'm saying? There's a lot of things still going on. We're trying to unite it. You know what I'm saying? We're trying to, I'm just trying to unite my people. You feel me? If I could, you know, tell them, give them s some experience from what I went through and, and let them know what, what happened to me and what I've been through and just shed some light on them and try to help them and, you know, help educate them. You know what I'm saying? As far as, you know, jobs and economy and st all stuff you really need to be into. That's what I'm trying to do these days, you know? Well, when you look, look at Hunter's point, in 2021 versus 20 years ago. Is it about the same? Is it worse? Or is it better? I would say it's about the same. Hmm. I would say it's about the same. Which is crazy because as someone who lives, you know, who grew up in the Bay Area, and I still consider that my home, you have to understand what San Francisco looks like outside of Hunter's Point in Sunnydale. Yeah. It's like... You, a one-bedroom apartment is like two, three million dollars. It's exactly. one of the most expensive real estate on the planet. On the planet. On the planet. Yeah. Like, it is so unbelievably pricey, and it's so high-end pretty much everywhere you go, and yet you have this one area that's still violent, still drug-infested, you know, still in poverty. They haven't been able to really, you know, put resources into it to kind of help it improve like the rest of the city has improved. Yeah. Why do you think that is? I mean, I think it ain't nobody speaking up or stepping up to the plate. You know what I'm saying? To start from the top. You know what I'm saying? If if you want to, you know, it's just like, you know, somebody got to speak up. Somebody got to step up. You know what I'm saying? Somebody got to bring them opportunities to the section or, 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 you know, impose it on the people. You know what I'm saying? Because if you don't know, you just don't know. If you don't know what's out there, you just don't know. 
You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And so I just feel like a lot of times the young generation, they just don't know. They don't know what's behind that door right there or that door over there, you know, because 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 learning could be easy if you just want to do it, you know. Well, when you were active, you know, a lot of violence happened. And whether you were involved in it or not, you being who you were at the position you were in, people are going to point the finger and feel like you're responsible. So someone's, you know, son gets killed, someone's brother gets killed, someone's best friend gets killed. There's still a certain level of feeling that Booby was somehow responsible for this directly or indirectly. Do you feel that that people still want to get you? Oh, yeah. And you still have to look over your shoulder? Oh, yeah. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Right. And that's why you don't go back to Hunter's Point. No, I just I just I just don't really go back because it ain't it it ain't you know, it just ain't time yet. You know, I'm fresh home, you know, and uh, you know, just like, you know, like I said, if I can't help the community, I don't want to I don't want to be around it. You know what I'm saying? And so I'm, I'm I'm more so just trying to help right now. I'm just trying to help. I'm trying to right right the little bit of wrongs. You know what I'm saying? I'm just, I'm just trying to be, you know, I'm just trying to be somebody, you know, use my influence in a positive way and help. And you know what I'm saying? I'm just trying to, I'm just trying to unify my people, man, and help them, man, any way I can, as far as jobs and whatever I could do. Because, you know, a lot of people offer me stuff, but I'm like, hold on. Little homie need that job. Give him that job. You know what I'm saying? I'm all right. Give it to him, though. The same job you offer me, give it to him. You know? Well, uh, when you look at RBL Posse, uh, Mr. C got killed, Hitman got killed, but Black C is still alive. Yeah. Have you made any contact with him at all? For what? I mean, I don't know, maybe to to squash certain issues you may have had. Or I, to- I, I, I don't would just did 19 years. Yeah. So, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, man. Um, you know, it's one of these stories that, uh, you know, especially since it's coming from an area that I, I considered home, uh, it's just kind of sad that, that so much violence had happened. Uh, so many people lost their lives. So many people went to prison. Yeah, over sad. this and and lost chunks of their lives in the process. Because think about if you got if you were given those nineteen years back, how much you could have accomplished exactly. on the outside. Exactly. Do you regret any of what you've done? Like, if you could go back and say, "I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna fuck with drugs at all. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna fuck with guns at all. I'm just gonna go a completely legit route." Would you have done it? Yeah, I pretty much was trying to do it, you know, but. You know, I didn't make it in time. So, you know, yeah, had, had, had I, had I uh, could turn the hands of time, you know, I, I could have did things a lot different. You know? Yeah. I could have did things a lot different, you know what I mean? And, uh, you know, I could have just walked away, you know? But, you know, I guess just, just the path God had for me, you know? So, you know? Well, what's next for you? Well... Shit, we got movies. I wrote a movie. We got a TV series. You know what I'm saying? We're going to do the movie. We're going to do the TV series. Got a couple artists, hot artists. You know what I'm saying? We're going we gonna, to we gonna bring it bring to the forefront. You know what I'm saying? And uh, some of them already out. You know, some of them we're going to develop. It's just real hot. And just, you know, I'm going to dibble-dabble in that a little bit, see where that go. And, uh, you know, just try to stay positive, man. And just, you know what I'm saying? And, and, and unify our people, man, I'm just trying to unify things and stay positive and, and and don't get sidetracked and stay focused. You know what I'm saying? You know, a lot of times, especially in hip hop, uh, prison gets glorified. Yeah. People brag about how much time they do. They, you know, it's, it's used as like a badge of honor in a certain way. But like, yeah. for example, I've, I've interviewed some of the biggest drug kingpins in the world. Yeah. From, from Lil D to to Freeway Ricky, to Boston George. And they all told me the same thing. They said that when they went in, they had a bunch of money, they had property, they put it in people's names, they had someone hold this for them, another person hold that for them. Mm -hmm. And they all said once they got out, it was all gone. Yeah. 
whatever money got put aside, that person spent because they felt you were never coming back. Whatever property got put in other people's names, it's now in their names. It's gone. <laughs> so, so, so you're not getting it back. What are you supposed to do? Try to press charges against them to get that no, property it's back? With. It's over. With. That's it, a, it, all that was a part of the sentence. All, all that, all that was part of it. Uh, is that pretty much your story as well? Well, I'm kind of a little bit lucky. You know, a little bit, a little bit, a little bit. But partly that came true. I can't say that. Can't say. OK, we'll leave that alone. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. But my point is, is that. Ultimately, th there's no win at the end. Oh, no, it's no, it's no winners. You go and in do it. your time. Oh, it's, there's definitely no winners in there's it. No, there's no prize at the end when you there's walk no out after There's no prize. There ain't nothing to glorify. You know what I'm saying? These are years that they took for me that I could never get back. It's, 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 not a, it's not a money amount or price in the world that could pay for freedom. You know what I'm saying? Or time. You know what I'm saying? So it's definitely ain't no winners in it. You know what I'm saying? It's definitely not. You know what I'm saying? Right. And, you know, when, when the RICO laws came in effect... You know, even though you didn't cooperate, eight people cooperated against you. Yes. So the whole thing of, you know, no snitching, you know, we don't cooperate, we don't tell. There's always going to be that in these types of operations every single time. Always. Always. So for because, anyone who's because, watching this, because if, they're, saying if, like, if they don't tell on each other, he's going to tell on somebody else. You know exactly. what I'm saying? So, you know. It, it might look good on record. Oh, we didn't tell on each other. But who did you tell on? Yeah. 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 Now, I remember Freeway Ricky, I remember he, he told me that, uh, you know, his own plug ended up testifying against him. Yeah, they do that. You know, the guy, that, uh, you know, Blandone, who was providing him thousands of kilos. Uh, and when he first got locked up, at first he was angry at this guy telling on him until he figured out that telling is part of the drug game. Yeah. So if you're going to get in the drug game, you have to assume that you're going to be told on. It's not a it's not an anomaly. It's not something that happens every so often. No, you have to assume that at some point when you're when you're dealing drugs, people are going to cooperate and tell on you. And that's going to help you get a ridiculous amount of years. Yeah. I would just say know the guidelines, know what you're into and know what you're putting other people up against, too, because, you know, what I'm saying. Yeah. You know, when you involve yourself with people, know the guideline, know what they looking at, too. Know what you looking at, but also know what they looking at. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> that's how you that's how you, you know what I'm saying. You know what's going on, you know. But like yeah. I say, it ain't no winners in it at all, man. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And that's my message to, to all the young bulls. You know what I'm saying? Ain't no winners in this, man. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And, you know, in 2000, you know, in 2021, man, there's so many legal ways to make money. That, that going down this route. Uh, and this is why we, we interview so many people like yourself, just to yeah. kind of show like, although there is a few years of balling out and yeah, you got the fancy cars and the jewelry and the girls and, and the stacks of cash, you're gonna lose all that. And the amount of time you balled out is gonna be replaced by way more time in prison. Oh yeah, they gonna make sure they give you three times as much time as you balled out. So if you, if you, if you balled out for five years, they're gonna give you 30. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yep. <laughs> they got the numbers yeah. correct, man. They got the numbers correct. You know what I'm saying? So you just got to know what you're doing, man. And, uh, you know, I advise everybody who out there getting a piece of change, man, go buy some property, man. Go, you know what I'm saying? Go go get you some property, man. Go buy your business. Go, you know what I'm saying? Go invest your money, man. You know what I'm saying? I, I advise that. You know what I'm saying? You know, build some generational wealth. You know what I mean? There you go. Uh, well, Booby, man, I appreciate you uh, sharing your story. I think a lot of people have, have heard your name and have heard the legend and, and everything else like that. But having you actually explain everything, the good and the bad, yeah. uh, I think is going to, you know, potentially stop someone from being the next Booby and ultimately getting the same sentence that you got. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Ain't no but winners now, in it, man. Take exactly, heed. Man. Take heed or uh, stand on it. You know what I mean? <laughs> There you go. Well, man, I appreciate you uh, coming yeah. in, man. Wish you all the best. All right, for sure, man. Appreciate you having me. Peace. All right.